Welcome to Reinventing Solidarity, a podcast of the journal New Labor Forum and the School of Labor and Urban Studies at the City University of New York. My name is Paula Finn, podcast host and editor of New Labor Forum. Reinventing Solidarity features scholars, activists, and artists on the front lines of movements for social and economic justice. We ask the essential and often provocative questions about race, class, gender, and the role of organized labor and social justice organizations in the work of creating a radically different world, a world with solidarity, equality, and sustainability at its heart. Today's podcast will look at what the coronavirus reveals about the advanced capitalist economies through which it spread so rapidly. Everywhere, the toll on the poor and working class, on migrants and people of color, has revealed the inability of worker organizations and political parties to defend them, including unions, social democratic parties, and our own democratic party. How did this come to be? And what signs are there that broad-based social struggle may be in the process of a revival in response to the grim realities that the pandemic has laid bare? We're very fortunate to have Samir Santi and Leo Panich taking up these questions in today's podcast. Samir, is New Labor Forum Book Reviews Editor and CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies faculty member. Panich is editor of the Socialist Register and author of numerous books, including The Making of Global Capitalism, The Political Economy of American Empire, and The Socialist Challenge Today, Sarisa Corbin Sanders. We're here in now approaching mid-September, about six months since the pandemic formally hit the U.S. and resulted in incredible amounts of preventable suffering and an economic crisis that's simply without precedent. Um, the U.S., of course, has the highest number of cases and the highest number of deaths anywhere in the world. And why things have improved a little bit in certain parts of the country, like the Northeast, it continues to rage in much of the country, including the South and the Midwest. On the economic front, Last week, another 880,000 people filed new unemployment claims. Prior to March, a number like that would have been simply jaw-dropping. Now it feels routine. Um, as of the end of August, around 30 million people in the U.S. were collecting unemployment, and the number of people who are actually out of work or underemployed is surely much higher than that. Meanwhile, the expanded unemployment program that was established in the early weeks of the crisis expired in mid-July, and Congress is yet to replace it. The executive order that Trump issued to provide some additional relief through FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Administration, has been slow to get going, and to date only 13 states are processing claims through it. And so all of this is to say that this has been an absolute nightmare on both the public health and the economic fronts. And it's easy enough to blame the Trump administration, to blame Congress, to blame many state governors around the country for what's going on. But I want to start by putting them aside for the moment. There's plenty of that on cable news and elsewhere. To, to begin, I want to start by talking about beyond Trump and those around him, what can explain why this pandemic has been so devastating? The short answer to that, especially given on the left, is neoliberalism. Uh, but I think most people don't really fully grasp what that word signifies. Uh, and I'm not sure myself that it's uh, uh, capacious enough to really get at the problem. Look, the, the problem goes back to 40, 50 years to uh, the time at which American corporations, which had uh, been so central to the development and payment of a uh, working class which was a high wage working class and which was able to secure for itself a privatized public health system, i.e. you got uh, you know, health benefits via your employer, et cetera. That began to unravel over the last 40, 50 years. 
And it also had massive effects in terms of uh, the racial question in the United States, closing off opportunities for working class black men in particular, who were much less likely to get jobs in a service economy. And if you look at the New York Times today, Nicholas Kristof has a remarkable piece on a, on a social progress index that was started in 2011, which measures uh, the, the real wealth of a society in terms of nutrition, uh, longevity, education, health, etc. And the United States is only one of three countries since 2011 who has gone down on the index, the other two being Hungary and Brazil, and the United States has gone down more than the United States or Brazil. So all of that needs to be combined with the lack of planning capacity in the American state, the rejection of it for a very, very long time, the meeting of public needs through private enterprise. And I've often given this example. Uh, back in 2006, the Department of Health set up a research and development authority, which in the wake of SARS uh, and, and the other viruses that had emerged by that point, was targeted with the responsibility of increasing the national stockpile of ventilators. It wasn't until the Obama administration in 2010 that uh, a search for contracts based on bidding coming from private corporations was undertaken uh, one was signed in 2012 with a Japanese firm based in California, a small firm, to provide ventilators at 3000 bucks each. The market price for ventilators was 10000 That firm was taken over a year later by a larger medical uh, production company in order to shut down that contract because they would have been underselling by $7,000 what they were selling it for. And then that firm, after it closed that contract, was taken over by an even larger medical production firm for 50 billion bucks. The result of that is that it was only last year, in 2019, that the FDA issued a new contract to produce ventilators by 2020. Uh, and that was only for 10,000 ventilators, not the 40,000 that had originally been planned for. This is just one example of the lack of planning capacity being so caught up in the problem of competitiveness in a capitalist system. Uh, it's not that the attempt isn't made, it's not even that money isn't spent. It is that the lack of coordination because of the chaos of capitalist competitiveness means that that capacity is not there. And I have to tell you, although it's been most terrible in the States, that lack of capacity has been visible in most other advanced capitalist states as well. Right. And, and, and this lack of planning capacity, which again, as you note, is, is particularly um, profound in the United States, has been a feature of neoliberalism around the world over the last several decades, as you note, and, and culminated in a sense, financially at least, as you note, in 2008. I want to use that to, to get to this, the specificity of this current economic crisis. So you talk about 2008, of course, a catastrophic event that, from which you know, many working people never recovered. Yet this crisis that we're, we're in now is exceptional in certain ways. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could spell out the ways in which the current COVID-related economic crisis is unique, perhaps in comparison to 2008 or even the Great Depression of the 1930s. Yeah, and, and uh, it is different. Uh, the previous crises uh, within the framework of globalization were a product of the way in which states had signed agreements to remove capital controls, to promote the free flow of capital, to treat foreign capital the same as domestic capital. That's mostly what free trade agreements are about. They weren't about reducing tariffs that mostly had taken place, except in the case of China, through the long post-war process before the WTO was established. And most of the financial crises were a product of the hot movements of capital around the world uh, in the financialized 
capitalism that accompanied globalization. That's what produced the 2008 crisis. It was a, you know, the banking crisis actually began in Europe, in, even with German banks. And, you know, they're generally seen as so, you know, social democratic and stable, having so heavily invested in uh, the American mortgage industry. You know, most of uh, black housing in the black areas of Cleveland uh, was underwritten by Deutsche Bank. So that was, that was at the center of the empire. That was a massive crisis, but it was one of some 70 financial crises that financialized globalization had produced. This crisis is very different. This is a crisis in production. And it's a crisis that does not emerge out of a sudden profitability crisis, even though profits have been relatively low. It doesn't emerge out of uh, the enormous debts of American corporations who have borrowed very, very heavily in corporate bonds, often in order to use that money to buy back stock, to enrich their managers, et cetera. It actually is a crisis that comes out of the state's response to a pandemic. The state closes down production. Not only the production of goods, but production of services. And in that context, of course, finance then seizes up. And the crisis would be much, much worse had the banking system, as happened in the early 1930s, uh, seized up. So, you know, this is a different crisis. What the American state became good at even as it lost so much capacity in other respects during the course of the previous crises, was containing financial crises. And the Federal Reserve and the Treasury developed enormous expertise. They said very openly, we can no longer prevent financial crises. The system is out of control in that sense. All of the innovation occurs because of it in the financial sector. What we can do, what we want to do, what we're good at is containing crises. And they proved that to be the case, even in 2008-9. And the first response of the American state, the effective one in, two, in March 2020, was for the Federal Reserve to play that role again. Because it was a crisis in production, it had to do it in a much bigger way than it ever did. And for the first time, the Federal Reserve actually bought private corporate debt because the scale of uh, the funds that were out there would lead to a collapse of the corporate debt system and the, and the collapse of those corporations, a bankruptcy, as, as lenders tried to get out of those bonds. It also lent directly to municipalities for the first time in, in American history. And above all, it played the large international role it's always played as the world central bank. It provided dollars to central banks around the world. Because whenever a crisis happens, world's capital runs for dollars. It runs for the safe currency, which is backed by the American Treasury bill. Uh, and, and the Federal Reserve acted first in mid-March. It took a while for Congress to act. And then it's true, it has to say, that they acted with the largest fiscal stimulus in American history, by far. Uh, and although, of course, as with the financial system, I mean, what the Fed does is it bails out the banking system in order to keep it going, right? Similarly, uh, the CARES Act was designed to bail out corporations. Large businesses, inevitably, much more than small ones through the payment protection program, et cetera. But the provision of $600 a week on top of unemployment insurance at the state level was something unheard of, not only in American history, but almost anywhere. And that's even apart from the check that Trump wrote to everybody for 1200 bucks uh, and, and signed his name to. <laughs> uh, so you see, this is something of an entirely different order both in terms of the cause of the crisis and of the state's response to it. And I, I kind of want, want to dig in a little bit here on, on these two points about the Federal Reserve and 
and about Congress. Um, as you note, of course, that the CARES Act stimulus of $600 a week in unemployment provision on top of on top of the baseline, which is paltry, of course, in the United States, was the largest fiscal stimulus in U.S. history. It it did tied a number of you know, millions of people over for the first months of this crisis. However, it expired in, in July, on July 31st. At the same time, there's this interesting dynamic here that you're describing with the Federal Reserve. In contrast to 1929, 1930, 1931, the Federal Reserve has learned, along with the Treasury and central banks elsewhere around the world, how to respond to crises to stabilize capitalism. In some ways, there's something ironic about this, I guess I should say, that the democratic processes through the legislature have been so paralyzed, yet the technocratic processes through the central banks have been efficient, not without contradictions, which you might spell out, but efficient. What does this say in your mind about the state of economic policy making in the US and the world today? Uh, and about the prospect of true democratization in the response? Well, it, it is indeed ironic. Uh, the Trump administration, which came, you know, Trump got elected by like, appealing to American workers directly as workers, as a working class. He used the word working class. He's doing it again in this campaign. And the Democrats kept talking about the middle class. And he appealed to them precisely in terms of them having been screwed by the free trade agreements, above all by NAFTA, but in general, by globalization. Once he got in, he reduced the capacity of the American state in all kinds of arenas. I mean, not only attacking Obamacare, uh, but undermining the Center for Disease Control, undermining the EPA, running down the capacity of the State Department and of the Treasury. The one institution which managed to retain its capacity under the Trump administration was the Federal Reserve. And, that, and he, that's despite various attempts he made to appoint all kinds of crazies to federal board, etc. The reason for this is, ironically, what the left criticized so much about central banks, which was that during this process of neoliberal globalization, they asserted their independence. And part of the role of the American Treasury and Federal Reserve and the IMF and the World Bank was to insist that other central banks assert their independence. What did that mean? That meant their independence from elected governments. That they would follow policies in monetary policy, which were not under pressure from elected governments to meet the basic welfare needs of their citizens not to engage in having large fiscal deficits, etc., to give the priority to paying off the investors if there's a deficit when you raise taxes, and not to give money to welfare recipients, right? But the independence of the central banks, especially the Federal Reserve under the Trump administration, which has so denigrated even further American state capacity, is that the Fed did not lose its capacity. So in terms of its remarkable ability to act as the world central bank coordinating the containment of crises, its remarkable ability to keep the banking system going. And imagine what would have happened if it had collapsed. And, and building off of that, um, you know, you're talking about these, the emphasis on central bank independence, the leadership, the Federal Reserve, the U.S. Central Bank has shown globally the ways in which other central banks have modeled themselves off of the Federal Reserve. All, all of this is an expression of, of what you and, and your co-author Sam Gindin um, have described as the central role of the U.S. state, the U.S. federal government in, in what you call superintending global capitalism. This is a role that the U.S. has played at least since the end of World War II. It's a role that has not been without consequence for working people in the United States. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what that role has looked like, and you've, you've done a little bit of this, but what that role has looked like over the last few decades, how you might see that changing, if at all, through the pandemic, and what all of this means for, for workers. What are, let's say, to put another way, the class politics of U.S. leadership in stabilizing global capitalism? 
A central thesis of that book was that the main cleavages in global capitalism are not so much between states as within them. Uh, and what we meant by that was that it, it's the balance of class forces within nation states that allows various nation states to play the role that they do in superintending global capitalism, managing their domestic economies with an eye to reproducing the global capitalist economy. Trump got elected as a result of the class cleavages inside the United States, increase, increasingly re represented through you know, racism and xenophobia, insofar as the American labor movement uh, had lost its capacity, if it ever had it, to organize effectively new sectors of the economy, and to build links between the providers of services and the clients of services, uh, to educate people on how capitalism works as a system uh, and why it's necessary to struggle against it. I want to ask, um, in closing, of course, there's no shortage of bleakness around. There's a lot, this is a very dark, every aspect of what you've described, every aspect of what may be coming insofar as, as some observers have noted, this may be a preview of the kinds of crises that, that climate change creates, social, political instability, economic disruption, natural world disasters. All that said, there have been some glimmers of hope for a new world, let's say, being born out of the ashes of the old, to borrow from the labor anthem, Solidarity Forever. In the US this summer, we saw incredible insurgencies against racist police violence, against economic inequality, that merged questions of racial injustice with economic inequality, austerity, public spending priorities. And it's possible, though by no means guaranteed, that this will develop into a broad-based social struggle against the barbarism, for lack of a better word, of the existing order. So can you talk a little bit about what you see as some of the new opportunities or terrains for social struggle that might emerge out of this nightmare we're living in? Yes, I should first of all say that ideologically, I think neoliberalism is uh, you know, really in trouble. It was never nearly the hegemonic ideology you know, that everybody assumed you know, was buying into it. it, it, it you could see that from the anti-globalization movement from Seattle on, that it wasn't as powerful a hegemony as many thought. But, you know, what is important here is the social democratic line that the New York Times is taking on what is required by way of uh, the decline in the standard of living and, and, and the more general living conditions in the United States. And that is reflected. In, in, I think, establishment media around the world. And that's not unimportant. That is not unimportant. We need to remember that the New Deal uh, was a class compromise. And Roosevelt, how often he was called a, so, a rapacious socialist by his capitalist enemies, uh, he was very much conscious that he was saving capitalism. And so I think this is not unimportant. When Boris Johnson goes on television, Boris Johnson, and says there is such a thing as society, he's directly speaking to the ghost of Margaret Thatcher in number 10 Downing Street. Right. Because her phrase was, you know, there is no such thing as society. There are only individuals and their families. So this is not unimportant, and it gives us an opportunity. That said, the nature of the Democratic Party, the nature of the Labour Party in Britain, the nature of social democracy in Europe, is such that they have embraced the logic of a global capitalism. And that means that they themselves are caught up in the contradictions and chaos of it without being able to break from it, as was evident by what happened to Corbyn, which was a product of the majority of labor MPs being determined that he not become prime minister. And similarly, you know, we always knew that Bernie's chances of getting elected were at best 40%, but the chances of getting the nomination were, you know, less than that. <laughs> so, uh, you, you know, I do think that the shift ideologically matters, but what really is going to matter is that the development of socialist aspirations and beliefs on the part of a new generation reflected in the DSA and momentum, and one hopes in a significant portion of Black Lives Matter, 
that that will have reverberations of the kind it did in the teachers union strikes after 2016. Many of the people who led them were inspired by Bernie's campaign in 2016. One has to hope that that will now reverberate to changing institutions in American society at the base. Above all, reviving the American labor movement. What is to be hoped is that the activists who were mobilized behind Sanders will become active not only in the street demonstrations, very important that that continue, but will become organizers of a working class which has been fragmented, miseducated, isolated, lumpenized in many ways. That is what people need to turn their attention to. We need to turn to a new process of class formation of the kind that produced the unions and the mass left parties at the beginning of the 20th century. I think that's a wonderful way to round out this part of the discussion. Leo, thank you so much for making the time to have this conversation with us. Thanks so much for having me, Samir. Samir, I found your conversation with Panitch equal parts bleak and hopeful. You acknowledge the continued embrace of the logic of global capitalism by social democratic parties and indeed the Democratic Party, yet also the rise of socialist tendencies within those parties as seen in Corbyn's momentum and in Sanders' strength in the 2016-2020 campaigns. Before joining the School of Labor and Urban Studies, you served as a special advisor on the 2020 Sanders campaign in North Carolina. What light did that experience shed on these dueling tendencies within the Democratic Party? That's a great question, Paul, and I think you pose it really well. Um, I think it really did exemplify both of the tendencies that you describe. On the one hand, of course, Sanders was soundly defeated by the neoliberal wing of the Democratic Party. And a lot of voters seem to have an appetite, certainly voters in the Southern primaries had an appetite more for that traditional tendency. At the same time, um, it was clear that a lot of what voters were looking for in this primary season was an assurance of someone who could be Trump. And it seems that there was increasing anxiety about Sanders' ability to do that. Whether that's true or not, we'll never know. But what is clear as well is that the issues that he campaigned on, Medicare for All, for example, were wildly popular. In South Carolina, for instance, where, where Sanders performed not terribly well relative to, to Biden, uh, Medicare for All's poll numbers were higher than they've ever been. They seem to be rising. And certainly in our experience and, it's, and, and my anecdotal experience, it was, it was an issue that, that had quite significant resonance with the voting population. So I think the conclusion is we've still got a long way to go in terms of persuading rank and file Democratic voters, especially that, that the left socialist, as you describe, wing of the party can compete in a national election. But we've certainly accomplished a lot in terms of shifting the center of gravity on what issues appeal to people. And I think given the way that the pandemic has upended the lives of everyone and intensified the economic insecurity that, that Leo and I talked about, um, and that that's not going away, it seems to me that there is reason to be somewhat hopeful that the issues around expanding public goods, decommodifying basic necessities, and the like have a real audience and have real traction that we can build upon. Engagement with issues like these form the basis of the classroom experience at the School of Labor and Urban Studies, where our preeminent faculty and engaged and diverse student body grapple with the most pressing challenges confronting organized labor and working class communities. For more information about the school, visit slu.cuny.edu. To learn more about the podcast, 
and listen to other episodes, visit slu.cuny.edu slash podcast. And to subscribe to the to New Labor Forum or sign up for our free monthly newsletter, visit newlaborforum.cuny.edu.